Welcome to this video in the Spectrum Protect Plus sizing series. This video covers tying it all together. So what to do after you've completed the Spectrum Protect Plus sizer and are ready to move on to actually allocating the storage, installing the software, installing possible updates, and adding in customizations. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jason Basler. The starting context of this video is that you have reviewed the blueprints, you have made a number of technology choices, you have gone through a sizing exercise, and one of the outputs of the sizing exercise is your vSNAP building block size. Due to the, what I have available in this environment that's free, what I'd like to do is say we're going to do a 25 terabyte vSNAP building block size, so we will deploy the Spectrum Protect Plus virtual appliance. We've made the technology choice to use virtual vSNAPs that we will use a VADP proxy running on the same machine as a vSNAP. We will be using compression, but not deduplication. We also have made the choice to use StoreWise as the backend storage platform. And so where I like to start here is on the, the StoreWise interface. This is a StoreWise V5030E, like we reference in the blueprint. Sign in here. Uh, Starting on the dashboard of, of the StoreWise, there's some interesting things you can explore here from the system interface. See, in our specifications, we specify the StoreWise controller, which is the V5030E. Click on here, you can see some of the, the details of the controller. So the controller is where we put our flash storage. So we're not fully populating the controller, but it does provide the flash storage and then this is the back view of the rear side of the controller. You can see we're using fiber channel here. There's also management network connectivity. Going back to the overview, you see there's also the expansion. And even though, relatively speaking, these two boxes are different sizes, you can see the expansion is actually quite a bit larger. So if you go to the top view, you can see how these are laid out, very dense. You know, each of these represents a disk module. Uh, so they're packed in very tightly so that we have 92 drives in this storage expansion. At the SAS chain view, you can kind of see how the expansion is connected to the controller through SAS cabling that is in the blueprint. So logically, this is one storage system. Um, the storage system is built around the SVC engine, so it provides a lot of virtualization capabilities. So a good place to start in understanding what we've provided is looking at the internal storage. So the blueprints specify a hybrid of storage where we have a smaller amount of flash storage. Again, that's in the controller, so you can see we have six of these 1.75 terabyte flash modules. If you click on this tab, you'll see just those modules. Now, I have already prepared these disks and, and using them, so when you start out with a new system, these would be listed as available drives, and I'll kind of go through the steps I went through to provision these in a moment. You can also see we have the six terabyte nearline SAS drives that we're using to provide capacity for our vSNAP pool. So we have 92 of these drives available. And at the next place to look is here on this panel, M disks by pools. Just like Spectrum Protect and Spectrum Protect Plus have this notion of a storage pool, StoreWise does as well, and this is really where the, the virtualization comes together. You can build arrays of disks together that provide space to a storage pool, and then from those storage pools, you can create volumes that are assigned out to host systems. And so when you're starting out, you create storage pools, and that's initially just an empty shell that will hold space. And so I have two storage pools I have already created. And I have named them DB Group 0 and Storage Pool Group 0. The naming really can be whatever you want. What I use as the DB Group, I tend to give space to databases, where so I put my flash storage under DB. So we could have named this pool Flash Pool. Again, it's just a name. If you expand it, in a pool, you have the components that provide space. And these are arrays in storewise terminology. So we group a number of disks together in an array and assign that to the storage pool. So here you can see a number of things. One is how much capacity is provided and then the type of array that we made. So in the blueprints, we recommend using distributed arrays of type RAID 6. So RAID is what provides the redundancy against drive loss. So again, I can right click on this array and get to the properties so we can see some of these in a bit more detail. 
So again, the arrays have names that you can give them, but more importantly is what's the type of storage that you have provided in the array and what RAID level are you using there? The, the blueprints give some advice for building these out. Because we, we only have six flash modules, there's no economical way to build multiple arrays with only six driving. Okay. But here with 92, it's absolutely, I split it in half, so I, I get 46 drives in each one of these. So if we could actually click here on the drives to see the member drives of that array, you can see there's 46 of them here, and, and exactly which ones were a, a component of that array. Now, that's one of the advantages is distributed arrays. You can build arrays with very large numbers of drives. Unlike a traditional RAID array where you dedicate spare capacity, where essentially you take a certain number of drives and they just sit there idly waiting to, to jump in in the event of a disk failure. With distributed arrays, every drive is active and they take a little bit of space out of every drive to provide the spare capacity. And in fact, that was one of those properties here. So if we look here, on one of these nearline SAS arrays, one of the properties is the number of rebuild areas. And what that means is out of those 46 drives, two complete drives worth of capacity distributed out across all 46 drives are available for rebuild. And what that means is we could handle two drive losses and then there's enough capacity in the array to take over for those failed drives. In, in the plus blueprint, we talk about the hardware specs for the 5030. And then here we give kind of the logical way out. And so, so we're using Flash for these purposes, right? So we say you have six 1.9 terabyte Flash drives. You want to make a array of type DRAID 6. In that array, there's only one of them, and you put all six of those disks in that array, and it will provide this much usable capacity. And for this, we want a single rebuild area. So that means one-sixth of this space is dedicated to the rebuild area. Six times two, it would be 12 terabytes, right? And why do we only have 5.16 usable? And so part of that is the RAID loss you get from using the RAID 6. RAID 6 basically means two drives worth of capacity are dedicated to parity. And then you lose a third drive for the rebuild area. So really, out of these six, we have three drives worth of capacity. And the other reality is what you saw on the screen, it was really only 1.75 terabytes. So this is where you go from the marketing on the disk capacity size. This is how much space we'll have to work with for creating volumes at the end of preparing all of the arrays and having all of the redundancy built in. Whereas for the nearline SAS drives, those six terabyte drives, we have 92 total drives. But in this case, we want to build two arrays, each one with 46 drive modules in them. And we want to have um, a total redundancy of four spare areas, but that's two per array, giving us a total of four. So if we, um, we had one array for the flash in its own storage pool, and then yep. we had a different storage pool for the nearline SAS capacity composed of two DRAID 6s, each with 46 drives and each with two. The detailed property, you can see some of those things that are, are made here. And this UI makes it really easy to make a pool and add capacity to the pool, and it will guide you through making good choices. And now you'll see here, this 5.17 usable capacity, I have actually already used quite a bit of my flash, as we'll see here in a moment. I have quite a bit of free space left. But again, and, and we have about 400 terabytes of usable capacity from these two arrays of nearline disks. Okay, so that, that's the notion of pools in arrays within pools, so then, and the next concept is volumes. And so you can go to volumes by pool. Again, we have a flash pool, where in here I have made a number of, of volumes already. The one I'm currently using for Spectrum Protect Plus is this one I've named SPP Blueprint Flash. So I have created a 3.1 terabyte flash volume. And so you can think of volumes, in another term they're often referred to as LUNs, so this is a unit of storage that you can assign to a compute system. So we're going to be able to create these volumes and assign them to VMware and eventually create a data store over them or use them as a raw device mapped disk. And we're actually going to show both of those examples. So you create volumes from the volume interface, an example of that. So we'll make a new flash volume. So again, I select this pool and create the create volume action. And I prefer to go to the custom menu here to have a little more control over how I create it. 
So a lot of things you can leave to as default here, but one thing you must do is, again, say what pool do you want to take this space from? So again, I'm going to go to this DB group zero where we have our flash storage. I'm going to leave these as defaults. I want to create a, a one volume, and now we only had about 600 gigs free here. So I'm going to make a 500 gigabyte volume, and I'm going to call this SPP flash two. We want to use thickly provisioned volumes. So we don't want you to do any of the choices that you have. We don't want you to do thin provision. We don't want you to do compression in the storeways or deduplication. So by choosing none here, you're choosing fully provisioned volumes and you're not doing any of the store-wise data reduction. The other change we make is to not wait for these volumes to format because that's very slow. So I'm going to create this volume. This is all virtualized, so these things tend to operate here pretty quickly. So in the case of the 5030E, I think you know we've provisioned it a system that is likely going to be fully saturated by plus. But there's other configurations. You know, someone might buy a, a store-wise V7000 or or have a cluster of store-wise that has more performance potential. We've provisioned one that in a lot of cases will be fully consumed just for Spectrum Protect Plus. And these are, you know, mid-range disk systems. But I'll notice here's the new one we just created. Again, 500 gigabytes. And currently, this is not mapped to any host. So although we've made it, no one can use it yet. But before we assign it, let's go ahead and, and provision what we need for the pool disks. So uh, again, I have a number of, of existing volumes, but the first thing I want to tie this back to, back to the, the blueprints in these tables we have. So there's a number of tables here, and first thing we need to zero on is which table do we want to reference. So again, we're using compression, but not deduplication, but we do want to have the VADP proxy role on the vSNAP. And so these first two tables, are for when you have the combined vSNAP and vADP. So table two is when you are using deduplication. Table three is the one where you are going to be using compression only. So this is the one we want to reference. And so I want to build a 25 terabyte vSNAP. And so we'll reference later that you know our vSNAP is going to want eight CPU cores, 40 gigabytes of memory. But the decision we need to look at now is the size and quantity of volumes we want to create in the near life staff. So we want to, to get to 25 terabytes by having five, five terabyte volumes. I'm going to set that aside for a moment. We'll, we'll come back here. And so we're going to create volumes. And I'm going to come into the custom path to do this. And so we're going to take this from our storage pool group, uh, which that is the pool of Nearline SAS storage. And we'll see we have only 100 terabytes out of the 400 being used right now. So we have plenty of space to, to work with here. So I want to create five volumes, not 51, but five. Each one is going to be five terabytes. And we can use whatever name we want, but I like to choose meaningful names that I'll remember. So we'll call this SPP vSNAP number two, and then we'll put an underscore here. It is going to give us volume name zero to four, but I prefer to think of beginning starting at one. So we're going to change that to be one to five. So again, we want to choose None for capacity savings. We don't want the store wise doing any of its built in thin provisioning or compression and so forth. And I'm going to not have the volumes be formatted. Create those. All right, so those five volumes we just created are now available here. Again, they're not mapped to anything yet. And each one is five terabytes. So now that we've made the volumes, we can look at the next phase. How do you assign them to the compute resource that are going to use them? And so store wise has this notion of hosts and host clusters. So hosts are standalone systems, and so I have two of them which are running VMware, and we'll see when we get into the vCenter in a minute that I have these two VMware hosts that are part of a cluster. So you can define them as hosts, and as part of defining a host, you're also identifying the adapters that it has, right? And so hosts connect to the store-wise either through a protocol. In, in our lab, we use fiber channel attachment. You know, the store-wise also supports iSCSI and, and NVMe attachment. In our case, we use Fiber Channel, and so we have identified in the SAN fabric we've connected to, we have two active connections off this. This host has two connected Fiber Channel ports that we can see, you know, that have been zoned to this store-wise, and we, we have mapped them to these host definitions. So you can add additional hosts, and when you do that, it will list the ports that it can see. And so 
one question that often comes up is, well, how do I know what fiber channel addresses a particular host has? And I'll show you in a moment a way you can see that in VMware. But for now, just realize we've created these. The next step is this notion of host clusters. And so when you have several hosts that participate together in a cluster, you want to define this notion of a host cluster in store-wise. So I've made a cluster that I call SP plus. And within there, we can see what hosts are part of that. So in that host cluster, I've added these two hosts that we defined. And so what this allows us to do is when we assign volumes, we can assign them to a host, which means every host that's part of that cluster has equal access. So that's a way we can have disks that are shared across multiple compute resources. And then the host cluster software, which is VMware in this case, takes care of managing access to these so that they don't compete, you know, they, they properly coordinate access and so forth. So VMware provides that role. Volumes by host cluster. So currently this host cluster has some of those other volumes I already created assigned. And what we actually want to do now is map some additional volumes, volumes by pool, and these ones we just made. So again, here's the new flash volume we made. It's currently not mapped, and I can right-click it, and I can say map to host or cluster, and then change this radio button to say host clusters, and so here is our SP plus cluster. I can select it and say next, and take some default choices. It's listing ones that are already mapped, and, and I'll say map volume. Wait a moment. This no will change to yes, and that's been mapped. And now we can come to our other storage pool where we created these five one terabyte ones, and I can select all five of these by holding down shift, right click here, and again say map to host or cluster. Choose host cluster. Select the SP plus cluster. Next map. Again, these will change from no to yes. So at this point, we have done everything we need to do to, on the store wise side to prepare, and so now we can. Finally, come in into vSense. Again, within our test lab, we have many clusters. Um, one in particular that we have is this cluster. We have a cluster that we've called Stretch. And in there are those two hosts you'll recognize from the store that we created host records for. So again, these two hosts are in a cluster. The cluster is named Stretch. And one thing, you know, kind of tying back to what you're seeing in the storewise is answering that question, well, how do I know what are those worldwide names that I want to look for when I create hosts that, you know, for fiber channel? So I've selected the host SP plus CA. I want to configure storage adapters, and, and we can see we have these MUX 16 gigabit adapters in here. And here is the worldwide port name that would show up on storewise. So again, these are online so that we know they're connected. And here are the worldwide names, Oops, two online ones. So these are what we would want to look for on the store-wise side as we create port definitions for those hosts. From storage devices, again, these are things that have been seen. And, and one thing that happens when you map new devices to a VMware host, it doesn't automatically see them right away. And one way you can force it to go off and look for new things is by coming to storage adapters and click this rescan storage button. So we want to scan for new storage devices, but we don't need to scan for new VMFS volumes because these are empty devices, don't, don't have a VMFS file system formatted on them yet. So we'll just scan for new devices. And one thing you can do is select these fiber channel ports here. Select it, look at devices, you know, you'll see all the devices. And again, we have many devices already assigned here. Uh, some of them are already data stores. I'm going to sort by capacity here, so maybe a little easier to find those new 5 terabyte ones. So here you'll notice we already have some 5 terabyte ones that are already formatted for a data store. So that's definitely something we want to, but these ones that are not consumed, you know, that's a good chance that these are the ones we're going to want to work with. But, you know, it's, it's good not to take chances in the world of this and make sure you're not consuming something you don't want. So we also have these serial numbers here. So there is actually possible to kind of connect the dots back to some of these volumes here. So again, this universal ID on the volume we created here, see if we can find devices on the VMware side that are matching the serial number. And so we have these leading digits, but they end with, here's 9B, 9A. So maybe let's try sorting based on, see if we can find all, all of them here. So I guess it's here, all these not consumed ones here, where they match. So we've got 99, 9Able, 9Baker, Charlie, and so forth. So these are the unused ones. There should also be the 500 gigabyte flash, and so that's this one, 500 gigabyte not consumed. Again, that's just helping people to 
kind of connect the dots here between the, the two interfaces. We're going to consume the storage. So what we'll do is we'll create a VMFS file system and data store over the flash. That way we can create virtual machines when we import the OVAs and use space from this flash data store. But we will use these five terabyte ones as raw device mapping disks. And so we'll show how to do both of those things now. Go to the data store. And from the context of this menu, we can come under storage and say, add a new data store. So we want to make a data store that has a VMFS file system over a disk one. And that's, again, that's that 500 gigabyte flash one that we assign. The first thing we do is we name it. And we're going to call this SPP underscore flash two. Maybe I like to put the type of disk in there to help as kind of a naming convention. And then the next thing we choose is, well, what device do we want to format that on? So this is, again, a kind of a similar interface to what we were looking at before, where we have a couple of breadcrumbs we can look at. One is the serial number, so it's a good idea to try to match that serial number. But one thing, this, this view filters out those devices that VMware knows are already being used. So they're trying to protect us from you know, clobbering a disk that's already used. So there is some safety net built into here that they shouldn't be listing things that are already used, but it's a good idea to double check. So first of all, we know our flash was a 500 gigabyte capacity, right? So that's the first thing we can check. We should then also say, know this serial number. So we'll quickly toggle back over to here and say, this flash volume we, we built has this serial number. It ends in 98. In the middle, there's an A03 Charlie A, you know, another breadcrumb we can look at. So, and it ends with 98. We see that A03 Charlie A. I'm liking that, yes, this is in fact the one that we're going to want to use for this new data storm. We have a choice of file system type to do our testing with the newer VMFS 6 type that you can get when you're using vSphere version 6. All right, so this screen is not entirely intuitive, but how big of a data store do we want to create on this? And I always maximize it. I use the full space. Some other choices you have are block size, and I tend to take defaults for these remaining choices. Click Finish, and we'll notice that a new task appears here where it is creating that VMFS file system on it, and it's only 500 gigs, and it's on Flash, so that was actually very quick. So now in this list here of available data stores, we see that our new data store is here, and that it is mostly free, which we would expect. Because these machines are in a cluster, that data store, even though we had SP Plus CEA selected, it's actually a data store that's now available to everything in the cluster. So if we click at that level and go back to data stores, we should, in fact, see that new data store here as well. All right, so now we have done all of the storage preparation steps we need to have done to begin creating Spectrum Protect virtual machines. So now we're going to shift gears a bit and start deploying the Plus software. So we'll start with this Spectrum Protect Plus virtual appliance. Where you create a machine is possible to do in the context of where you click. So here we have our cluster. So I could right click on the cluster and say deploy an OVF template. But in fact, I have a number of resource groups under this cluster that I like to organize things by. So I actually want to create it under this resource group here that I call SPP. And I'm going to deploy it at this level. And I'm going to say deploy an OVF template. I have downloaded the Spectrum Protect Plus code already onto my local system here so I can browse. So I have downloaded a number of, of bits of code. So one of these is the OVA of the Spectrum Protect Plus appliance. I'm going to select that as what I want to deploy and click Next. Um, so you always have to give your virtual machine a name. I like to put the host name that we are going to use as part of. So I'm going to use a host name I have available called SP Plus C48. The next question is, what data center do you want to put it in? So I want to put it into this existing data center I have called Tucson underscore blueprint resource. I want it under the stress cluster because I had selected the SPP info and I started it's taking this by default. And it is validating that, yes, all of the hosts in this cluster under that resource group are compatible with running this appliance. So that's something that it actually won't let us proceed unless that compatibility check has succeeded. So, you know, some examples of why it might not succeed is you don't have enough memory or CPU to absorb that virtual appliance, or you don't have a network that's suitable. Behind the scenes, it's actually started putting that package to the host. So this step takes a bit of time to, to get this validation. This is an informational panel giving us some details about the appliance. You can click Next. Very important that you read through every word and detail of this license agreement and then accept it. All right, now this part's important. So this is where we choose which data store do we want to deploy this virtual appliance to. 
with 500 gigs. Well, we only had 500, and we want to show you how to make a data store, but be aware 500 is really not enough. You're going to need more space. Again, we've had some customers reading the blueprint that got a bit confused at this point, thinking, well, do I use raw device maps at this point, or do I use storage from a data store? And it absolutely has to be from a data store. So here's that new data store we just created that has a little more than 500 gigs free in it. So we're going to choose that. And again, it did a compatibility check, which, among other things, confirmed we have enough space to actually handle this virtual machine image. Um, the next is you have to choose which virtual network that you want to use. And so this also is important because you may have multiple virtual networks, and, and one of them is the one that you actually want to use. So in the VMware world, your physical host can have many network connections coming into them. They can be connected to many switches, and you build virtual networks that connect to some of those physical network components on the back end. So I happen to know we have a virtual distributed switch where this distributed port group is the one that has the high-speed networking that we're going to want to use. The, the VM network, that's the default choice, was not a good choice for us. So I've overridden this to choose a different virtual network. And finally, this is also very important here. This is where you customize the networking. And there's really two paths you go down into here. One is if you have a network that has a DHCP providing mechanism, where essentially DHCP is the ability to automatically assign IP addresses to the computers that start up on it, you can leave a lot of these fields blank. Our network in the Tucson lab uses static IP addresses where we have to tell precisely which IP address and host name to use. And so I'm going to go ahead and fill out all of these fields. So the host name SP plus charlie48.storage.tucson.ibm.com. And because we're not using the HTTP, I have to assign a static address. And so in our case, that is 9.11.62.99. Now, the network prefixes, um, subnet mask is another term that's used for this, and there's two forms of subnet mask. At this point, it's telling you it's critical. You use the shortened form of the subnet mask. This long form is not supported. So in our network, our subnet mask has the short form of 23. Our network has a gateway of 9.11.62.1. And we have a DNS server running on 9.11.227.25. And our domain is storage.tucson.ibm.com. Finish. All right. Um, so again, this is had I had the full four terabytes available, it would have made a more compelling case. And so what I'm going to do is go through that again, walk through it a bit faster this time. And I'm going to choose the other data store I've already created. And so when we when we come to this point where we choose the data store, we'll choose the one I had already made that's also on Flash that's quite a bit larger. This is the one we made, you know, so you can see it. Notice it's here as a choice, but this is not enough space, right? So what we're really going to go to is the one I had already made earlier that we all have other things running on, which has you know more than two terabytes free. This is the where we're going to be deploying virtual appliances. All right, now let's go through and enter these bits of data. All right, now uh, that is starting a new, as that one's deploying. And so what we can do while that one's deploying is start the next step, which is deploying the, the virtual vSnap. Now I'm going to deploy 10.1.4 vSnap so that we can demonstrate the procedure for upgrading a vSnap with a run file, because those are other steps in the, in the blueprint that may be useful. And also just choose the 1014 again so this was the OVA for SPP server but in this case we want the combination vsnap vadp OVA is what we're going to select I'm going to say next I'm going to name this one SP plus charlie 49 so again a different host name make some of the same choices we made for our SPP server The license agreement. Okay, so again, we need to choose where do we want to put this. So again, we also want the vSnap to run on our Flash data store that we created. And again, I'm using the one that already exists. And you can see the free space is now down below where it was when we deployed the SPP server here because it's taken some of that free space. But we still have plenty of free space here. And again, the vSnap is going to be getting most of its storage from raw device maps that we'll assign here in a moment. But for deploying 
the VSNAP, we only need enough space to hold its operating system disks. And, and so and even though it's going to be a 25 terabyte VSNAP, we don't need 25 terabytes of free flash space. We just need enough for the operating system. And so again, we have to make the same virtual network selection that we did for the SPP server. And this is for the VADP proxy to talk back to the SPP server. So that's actually back to the SP plus Charlie. This must be an IP address. You cannot put a host name here. So this is an important you don't need to know that it's, this has to be the IP address because at the time this is used during the deployment, DNS is not active yet. So it can't actually look up what that IP address says. So here I need to put in what we assigned to the SPP server, which was 9.11.62.99. And then here's where I put the host name of the new vSnap. So in this case, this one is going to be SP plus charlie49.storage.tucson.ibm.com. And our IP address will be 9.11.62.100. Same network prefix of 23. Gateway is the same at 9.11.62.1. Our DNS IP address is the same at 9.11.227.25. And then again, our domain is the same at storage.tucson.ibm.com. Click Next and let that complete. And so one thing we'll notice while we were busy doing that, the deployment of our SPP server, Charlie 48, completed successfully. These deployments, um, since this is going to a flash data store, are actually quite fast. It's just a few minutes of, of time for the OVF deployment to finish. When these finish, what I'll do is then expand this resource group so we can see the virtual machines in there. We'll see that we actually have two machines that haven't been powered on yet. So I'll go ahead and do that now. Um, so those two new machines are, this one was our SPP server. And then this one is our vSnap combo, which is still on deploying. So we don't want to power it on yet. But since this one has finished, it's safe for us to power this one on. And on first power on, it takes a while for the machine to boot up and for some of the internal configuration to take place. And so we're going to give that a head start here. So, wait, so you'll notice the vSnap deployment just finished, so this is now also a viable machine. But for the vSnap, it's important. You don't want to power this one on until you make some adjustments to its you know, the, the settings of the virtual machine. So there were some settings for both of these machines that are baked in as part of the appliance. So if we look at the SPP server, for example, it's virtual hardware. You know, It's defined that it has 48 gigabytes of virtual memory and eight CPU cores. That's baked into the OVA. We didn't set that. It also has a number of internal virtual hard disks and so on. And so we recommend for the SPP server, you don't change these. You know, you may want to bump some of them up if you have a lot of available resources on your host. But um, for most cases, it's sufficient just to leave those alone. But on the vSnap, we do want to make some adjustments by going right-clicking it and going to Edit Settings. And there's a number of things here. And so the first is we want the memory and CPU to match what we found in that blueprint table. And so you recall this is the row we highlighted here. We wanted eight cores and 40 gigabytes. And so it turns out actually that uh, by default those things are are good. I mean by default the CPU core was right, but the memory we needed to make an adjustment. And so we're going to change this 32 to 40 to be in line with the blueprint. Now here's a key point that actually is described in the blueprint that's important. And so there's three built-in internal hard disks. Hard disk one is critical. This is where the operating system of the vSnap, and we don't want to do anything to this. But this one, this 100 gigabyte, is a built-in demo um, pool that is really not needed in any production environment. And so this is taking 100 gigabytes of our flash space, um, and, and that's wasteful since we don't want to use it. So actually, the blueprint suggests that you remove this disk. And you can accomplish that by going over here and clicking this X. And check this box that says delete the files that were behind this from the data store. Um, this 128 is used if you are doing three copies, either copy to cloud or archive to cloud. And there's some cases where the blueprint will actually have you extend this space. Um, we're not planning to do any copy to cloud, so I'm going to leave this at its default of 128. But there may be some cases where you would actually be increasing the capacity of this, and the blueprint discusses 
is how to do that. Everything else, we're going to leave the same right now. So now that I've made those changes, I'm going to click OK. And you'll see that the task started to do a reconfiguration and then completed very quickly. So once that reconfiguration task is completed, we can now power on this machine for the vSnap as well. All right. So one question is, how do you know when the, the first boot up of the SPP appliance is completed and it's ready to be used? One quick answer is to try to access it from the web interface. And so we'll add another tab here into our, our web browser and come to, and since we're using a self-signed security SSL certificate, we have to accept that here initially in order to access it. And so if you sign in and you get this message that the server is being brought up, please wait. That tells us it's still going through its initial configuration. And so we're going to have to wait for that step to finish. We can see now that the Spectrum Protect Plus server has completed its boot up an initial configuration as evidenced by the fact it's now giving us the login prompt. Before we sign in and do that, let's check the progress on our, our vSnap. We'll see vSnap is also powered on. We'll begin by doing some of the initial steps on the Spectrum Protect Plus server, and then we'll have to go complete our vSnap configuration. I'm going to sign in, and by default, there is an administrator account and admin with the default password of password. Sign in with that account. We have to update a few things. So the first thing is we're not allowed to keep this account name admin. We're forced to change it to an account name other than one of these three root admin or tests. Change that account to be my name. Password that was originally password, we now need to set to a new, more secure password. So I'm going to set that new password here and say OK. We are also at this time forced to reset the server admin password. So server admin is an account, the operating system that you could log into in case you need to get to the console to service it, determine what the, the default password is. So that's something that is actually referenced in the blueprint. So let me, we indicate that the initial password, PPDP758-SYZ, provide that default password. Give it a new secure password. You'll see the requirements that this password needs to meet. So now that that's been changed, we can sign in with the admin account that we changed to. All right, so when, upon signing in for the first time, we're presented with this choice to initialize storage. And what this is referring to is a small amount of storage that's built in to the Spectrum Protect Plus server appliance for demonstration purposes. And so really, when you're building a blueprint, uh, you should not be using this storage. So we're eventually going to remove it. Um, so although it does have to initialize, um, it doesn't matter which of these choices we make, because we're going to remove this storage. And upon signing on for the first time, you get a chance to review the quick start information. And so this is a, a general sequence of steps that we'll go through now to, to show you how to to accomplish these tasks in the context of a blueprint. We can also see, when you log in for the first time, some details about what's new in the latest release. So we're at a point now where we've done as much as we can in plus. Well, I take that back. There's one step I'm going to, to kick off now, because it takes some time to, to do the inventory. And I'm going to register our hypervisor so that by the time we get our vSnap system set up, that inventory task will have been completed and we'll have some virtual machines that we can back up. So I'm going to go under Manage Protection, Hypervisors, VMware. Before we'll be able to do any VMware backups, we're going to have to connect Spectrum Protect Plus to our virtual center. Click here to say Manage the vCenter, and we will add the vCenter. This will be vCenter 2012. Store login as myself. Save. See now that we have registered that vCenter. So that will automatically kick off an inventory job. We will go out and discover all of the virtual machines and so forth. Now let's jump back to our Blueprint document for a bit. And you'll notice we have some instructions on 
snap server installation and setup. And so this is after you've deployed the virtual appliance or in the case of a physical machine, there's some additional steps that you need to take to configure it. And one of those steps is that we created those five terabyte disk lens. We have yet to assign them to the virtual machine. So we'll come back to the vCenter interface for a moment. And again, here's our, our vSnap server. And so I am going to right click here and go back to the edit settings. And what we want to do is add some new to this. So we're going to be adding five disks as raw device mapping disks. We're going to have to repeat this process for all five of the disks that we have assigned. So we click Add new device, and we want to add an RDM disk. And again, this should only be listing to us disks that are not currently being used by something else. And we you know we should see five five terabyte devices here, which we do. But again, it's it's good practice to also validate that these device IDs match. And recall from when we looked at them before, we had 99 through 9 dog here is matches what we were expecting. So these are in fact the ones we're looking. So really, it's not all that important what order we select these. But I'm going to repeat this five times here. So we'll pick this first one. And you'll see new hard disk. Also notice that it is automatically going to be in a compatibility mode of physical. The choices are physical and virtual, but we, we want to choose the physical compatibility mode. I'm going to do this four more times for the remaining five terabyte devices. And one more time. All right, so here we have one, two, three, four, five, five terabyte RDM disk. So we'll say OK to make that change official. You notice we didn't power down the, the machine before we did that. Obviously, there's a number of machine configuration changes that you actually can't make with the machine running. So, for example, if we wanted to add memory to it, it would be necessary to shut it down. But adding disks is one of the things you can do without powering the machine down, which is going to be the blueprint documentation here for a moment. We have these steps in Chapter 5 that walk you through what it takes to deploy it. And you'll notice some of these we've already done. These are considerations for when you deploy the OVA, adjusting the memory, deleting that extra 100 gigabyte disk. We have accomplished that. We have assigned ones. Now, I do want to note we did not assign the 20 gigabyte log device and the 100 gigabyte cache. So at a 25 terabyte, they actually want a, a log device where the cache device is not required. So we're going to make a, a 10 gigabyte virtual hard disk for this machine in addition to those five RDMs that we just created. So let's go back and do that now. Go back here and edit the settings one more time. So again, we'll see hard disks, those ones we've already created are still here. What we want to do now is add a new device. This time, instead of an RDM, we're going to add a, a hard disk. So this is a virtual hard disk that will be stored in the flash data store. Here's that new hard disk. The first thing we'll say is we only need 10, 10 gigabytes. And we want to keep some defaults here. So one is we always want to use thick virtual disks. We don't want to use thin provision disks for the reason. We're also going to choose for a location this choice to store it with the virtual machine. Because we deployed this virtual machine in the flash storage, taking this default will guarantee that this 10 gigabyte disk is also going to be consuming space from that flash storage device. So really, we can, we can keep all defaults here with the exception of the size. We, you know, we overrode the default size here, so I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So now we have modified this machine, so we have a new 10 gigabyte hard disk, and we also have five, five terabyte RDM attached disks. All right, so now that we have done that, we're going to have to, at this point, connect to the vSnap system through an SSH connection to, to continue with the configuration. This is Chapter 5, working our way through. And so we added the log. So now that we have these different devices, um, we have already powered on the vSnap. Um, but we're going to connect with SSH Again, the vSnap has a server admin ID, just like the, the Plus server does, with the same default password. So we're going to sign in. We're going to change that 
user's password, and we're going to use the vSnap command line to do a number of steps to prepare this vSnap for use. Okay. Set this aside, come back. I use PuTTY, Windows, to access things through SSH, so we'll go to SP+. Plus. So again, we have to sign on as server admin and use the default password. So once you've typed in the wristwatch, it forces us to change it. So you have to type the current password in one more time, and then you have to give it a new password. Enter that new password a second time, then we get kicked out. So it's normal, actually, after changing the password to get kicked out. So now we have to restart PuTTY, connect in again, sign in as server admin with the new password that we just changed it to, and you'll see that we are able to get a command prompt. So once you are in the vSnap, you have a number of commands that are given in the blueprint that we need to do. So the first thing we need to do is to hair uh, the vSnap software. There's some initialization that needs to happen, and that is done with the vSnap system init command. And this is really the equivalent of that pop-up that appeared on the GUI when we signed in. That was doing the initialization of the default built-in pool. One reason we don't want to do that automatic initialization is we want to add a parameter which says skip pool. This skips the automatic creation of a pool because we're going to want to create our pool with some advanced options that you are not presented when you do this through the, the user interface, which is why we're doing this manually. So this will initialize all of the vSnap software, but it will leave the step of creating the pool. Let's take some moment here. All right, so that's finished, and it presents some information to us about the nature of this. And so one thing we'll notice right away is we're still at, at 10.1.4. So I want to upgrade demonstrate how you can update the appliance. So we want our vSnap to be consistently at the same 10.1.5 level that the SPP server is running. One of the software packages that you get when you download Plus is a vSnap image that is a .run file. So that is the vSnap software that can be installed to an existing operating system. And so we're going to do that now. And so first of all, let's find out what directory we want to put that in. We're going to use WinSCP to copy over these software packages over to the vSnap system. So I can sign in to SP Plus Charlie49 with the same server admin ID and password that I reset it to. Notice we're in that home directory here on vSnap system on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, I'm going to change to my M drive where I, I keep software, and I'm going to come here. You'll see two things that we want. So first of all, the vSnap software itself is this .run file that I mentioned. So I'm going to simply drag this across over to here to get the run file. Um, in addition to upgrading vSnap, you can also optionally, and then actually this is recommended, to upgrade the operating system components as well. Since we deployed this vSnap as a virtual image, the updates to the operating system, so things like security patches that come in over time, et cetera, we provide those as part of this ISO file. And so this ISO file has two purposes. It is useful for upgrading the SP Plus server itself, but it is also useful for providing operating system updates to the vSnap. I'm going to copy this file over as well, those operating system updates. So the way you force it to do the operating system updates is you copy that ISO file into the slash TMP directory on the vSnap prior to starting the installation with the run file. And so that run file installer knows to look under the temp directory for that update package and will automatically apply those, those updates during part of the vSnap installation. So we'll go ahead and let update package copy over. And while that's copying, we'll do a few more preparation steps over here. So one of the steps I um, skipped over after the system init skip pool is the vSnap user create command. So we can certainly use the server admin ID. Um, in the blueprint, we show you making a new user ID. And so we, um, in the vSnap command, there is a vSnap user create command you can issue. We could say we want another user that we'll call vSnap1. This is the one we're going to be used for connectivity to plus. So we give it a name, and we also set a password for this user. So this um, user is capable of being the user whose credentials we're going to specify in a moment when we register this vSnap back to the Spectrum Protect Plus server. So now if I do an ls in here, see we've got the ISO file as well as the run file. So first thing I'm going to do is a sudo move. And we're going to move this file to slash temp. The next thing we're going to do is give execute permissions to this run file. We are going to execute. We're going to say sudo dot slash execute this run file. All 
right? So the first thing this does is present a license agreement to us that we have to read through before we say yes. To from here forward, it's going to ask us a few more questions. The first is letting us know that this version of vSnap is going to install an updated kernel, telling us what level. And so this is basically telling us that this kernel update will be installed and it will become the new default. The old kernel will still be there in the event we need to revert it back. But we can't proceed and, and use vSnap unless we allow this upgrade to take place. So we're going to say yes. So much of the steps going forward are all automated. So it's updating a number of operating system packages. It will also be updating the, the vSnap code itself. When this is all said and done, since it put a new kernel on here, it's going to require us to, to reboot the system. Update between 10.14 and 10.15. There's, there's quite a bit of operating system updates that are included. So this, this takes a few minutes. At this point, this is a new system. We know it's not taking backups, and no restores have been done. So we didn't have to do any prerequisite checking here. The sort before we get. But if this were an existing vSnap that's in production, you know, we'd want to do preparation steps such as making sure that the system is idle. And all right, well, this is going to take a bit of time to finish this upgrade. So let's switch back for a moment onto the SPP side. One thing we can confirm is that this inventory that I said was going to start automatically, you can see that it reported that it has finished. And as a result of that, we can now see, you know, browse through our, our VMware inventory that's on the vCenter. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's do another couple bits of good housekeeping consideration is the users that you will have managing your system. And so by default, we have the user that we changed the name for when we first signed on. And we can certainly add our colleagues in as other users here. Users are used to log into the Spectrum Protect Plus. So we'll go ahead and make one more here just so you can see how straightforward that can be. And so uh, we want Trisha to be able to use the same system. And so we'll make a new account for her. With the password is going to be password. <laughs> Looking at this, and we're going to make you a sysadmin so that you have all of the rights. And as a sysadmin, we want you to have all of the rights to everything that's in the system. So you are essentially a, a super user in this case. Now, I, I use the term super user. And in fact, there is only one super user that you can have. But a sysadmin that has assigned all resources has the same authority as the super user. Now, I want to make a distinction between these users that are used to sign into Spectrum Plus versus identities. So identities are where we keep the things that are used to sign into other components. And so as an example, an identity was created when I registered my vCenter hypervisor. And this is an identity that stores the account credentials needed to access that identity or that resource. And so a reason you might want to come in here is, let's say, your, your password. Let's say my password for jbasler at sp.local on my vCenter changed. I could come in here and provide a new password so that we would not lose connectivity. Another useful thing here is you may be deploying more than one vSnap, for example. And over time, your business likely will be changing passwords on those vSnaps. And you may want to use the same password across those vSnaps. You could have a, a separate identity for every single vSnap. One convenience I like to use is to, to share identities across different components. And so I'm going to say we have an identity called vSnap. vSnap tells me this is a password I'm using for vSnap systems, and this is the name of the user that we created with the vSnap user create command. The identity has a name, it goes to a username, and so the username is actually vSnap1. Password we set for it. I will enter here, save that. So currently they're, they're not using this, but when we register this vSnap after its software update works, we'll use this identity to make that connection. Check back now and see how our software is. Okay, so we'll just scroll up here a bit to kind of see some of the things that, that happen while we're running. So all the, you know, the operating system updates through, here's where we did the kernel update. We edited the default boot circumstances for the kernel updated some other internal vSnap components at this point. Finally, we updated some of the vSnap software components itself. So all of that happened, and so we're now at the end of the upgrade, and this is the point where it's telling us that we're required to do a reboot. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes. Actually, I'm going to say no, just so we can prove one point here. If I say you name, you'll see that we were this kernel level here. I'll come back and check after the reboot to 
see what the act of kernel is. So I'm going to say sudo reboot at this point. We'll give that a few minutes to, while that's completing, I think we can demonstrate another use case. And that is how do we update the Spectrum Protect Plus server itself? And so we signed into our Spectrum Protect Plus server, but there's also a service interface. So we can sign into SP Plus and override it to go to port 80, on 8090 the service interface, and you can sign into the service interface with the same user credential that you use to sign in if, you have, if it has enough authority. And so in our case, the super user or sysadmin are allowed to sign in. And there's a number of management things you can do here. And one of those is to manage the updates to the system. Okay. One thing it's doing at this point is updates can automatically be obtained from the internet. So if your Spectrum Protect Plus server is on a network that has access to the network, it detects that there is a software update available, and we can simply click this green button to bring us to the latest level of software. Alternatively, you may have a specific package that you've downloaded from Fix Central or that support has directed you to that's not available on this patch server, and, and that's done in the form of that ISO file. So the same ISO file we copied to the vSnap and put in the temp directory, we could browse here go find an ISO file, right? So let's say, for example, I wanted to go to 10.15 fix2, for example. I could select this ISO file, put it in, and then upload it and update from it. I know in my case, I'm OK, actually, with what's considered the latest available patch level. And so I'm just going to go to that and take it from the, the repository. So one best practice we have when updating server, since it's a virtual machine, it's nice to have a rollback option when you're doing a, an update. So that's something we can actually come to here and take advantage of the ability for VMware to, to take a snapshot. So I'm going to right-click our protect server, take a snapshot, say before software upgrade. I'm not going to snapshot the memory. There's a very little chance we're going to need to go back to this. All right, so that snapshot has been created. I'm going to click this button, initiate a software upgrade. So this software upgrade is downloading from the patch repository, that latest patch, automatically and going to apply all of those software updates. Uh, part of this update will be restarting the Spectrum Protect Plus server, and it will have to, to boot up again. You'll know this is finished. It returns to the login screen for the service interface. If we were to come back here to our Plus server where we were logged in, you'll get the screen saying it's, it's busy. You can't sign in right now. So this will go away as well once the install is done. It says reboot. Right, so I think we've given vSnap enough time to finish its reboot. So let's go ahead and sign back in and complete our vSnap configuration. So we're going to sign in to SP Plus password. First thing, let's check is that kernel level that we looked at before, a slightly newer kernel level. So that kernel update happened. We can also say vSnap system show. See that our vSnap version is no longer 10.14. We're now up at a 10.15 vSnap version, so our vSnap upgrade was successful. And back to this topic we were looking at in the blueprint, we took a little bit of a side step to get our software updated. We're going to now begin to configure the pool. And so we're going to resume our steps at this point where it talks about rescanning for change to sun. You recall I added the disk when the machine was powered on? This vSnap disk rescan command is a way to discover newly attached devices when you haven't rebooted the machine. Since we've rebooted, this, the equivalent of this command has already taken place. So these disks would have already been discovered as part of the reboot. But had we not done the software update, this command would be useful to force it to, to find the newly added disks that we created. So we'll go on and actually start with this step. We should already be able to see them. vSnap disk show. Take a look here. Now, the first thing is you want to be aware of disks that you don't want to use. So as an example, you recall this machine had a 50 gigabyte disk. That it was the operating system disk. So the reality is we really don't want to use any disks that are not being shown as unused. So we have two disks. We have that 50 gigabyte disk. We also have the 128 gigabyte disk, which is the, the space to be used for the cloud cache. But again, we don't want to use that. So dev SDA. And dev SDC, those are off limits. We don't want to use those disks because they're, they're part of the operating system. But we'll notice we have one, two, three, four, five, five terabyte disks that are unused. Those are our pool disks. We also have a 10 gigabyte unused disk, which is the space that is going to be used for the log. Right, so also in the blueprint now, we give you the command vSnap pool create that you can use to create a pool. So 
is fairly straightforward. So we, again, we're going to do one with deduplication off, but compression turned on. So the command is vsnap pool create. And the name of the pool is primary. It, you don't want to change that name. And then you give it a list of disks to use for the pool. So our case, the first one we want is this first unused 5 terabyte, and that is dev sdb. So this is a comma-separated list we're going to be providing. So I'm going to go one at a time and grab all of these unused 5 terabyte disks. And then now we'll also add deduplication off, compression on, also going to use encryption. So we're going to say encryption on, encryption type disk. Um, encryption type only supports one option currently today, which is always disk. That is, should be the command we need, so I'll go ahead and enter. That will take a moment as it's preparing all of this storage to have a vSnap pool. But since we only assigned 40 gigs of RAM, we did not provision enough resource for deduplication. But again, these are our technology choices where the user gets to make the decision whether or not they want to. When this finishes, it should prevent, print out a, a summary form. This information that printed is the same information that you get when you do the vSnap pool show command. So first of all, you want to make sure it reflected our choices relative to compression and deduplication, and it did. Next thing to confirm is just the amount of free space we were expecting. So our intention was to build a pool with 25 terabytes of space. That, in fact, is what we got. You notice free space is, is less than that. So this is what the blueprint refers to as slop space. There's some overhead in the pool. The amount of space used depends on the size of the pool. You're you can see quite a bit of, of free space, and currently we haven't really stored anything in the so these numbers um, at this point are relatively low. So at this point, we're almost ready to go. We have our pool that is composed of five disks. Now, the other thing that's worth noting is this is RAID 0. And the blueprint goes into a lot of detail here about choosing between having your disk system provide RAID and having vSnap itself provide RAID. And in our case, since we're using StoreWise and it has a very sophisticated hardware RAID system, we chose to make distributed RAID 6 in the disk subsystem. We don't want vSnap to be using its software RAID. So that's why we chose RAID 0 here. Each of these devices is already protected by RAID. If we were using something like a, a JBOD where we just had dumb disks that weren't able to do their own RAID, we could have chosen to have vSnap create these disks with RAID 6 at the software level. So that's an important distinction here. The one step we have left to do at this point is to add that log device. And so again, I'm going to go back to the vSnap disk show. I'll put here and remind herself what that, that device name was. And so that was dev sdh. And actually, before I do that, if we scroll up here a little bit back to the Apple, you'll notice this pool had an ID of 1. And so that's normally the case. There are some cases where you might create a pool, delete it, and make a new one before you use it. And in those cases, these IDs may increment to something other than 1. But I'll show you here now why that's relevant. So I'm going to say sudo vsnap pool add log. So we're adding the log device, and we're going to say ID1. So that's where that ID number from the pool comes from. And we're going to give it a disk width. In this case, it's just a single disk. We're going to put the div STH there and hit Enter. So it is now adding that log. And when it's finished, we should get another automatic vSnap pool show output, which should confirm that we now have the log device added in. This size, the cache device wasn't required, but should we? have been at a larger size where we do need a cache, we would again add this vSnap pool add cache command. It's very similar to the add log where we give the ID and the device name that we want that cache device to be. So again, it automatically told us vSnap pool show again. So the only thing that's changed is we now have a log device. So at this point, we're, we're finished with needing to issue commands on the command line. And so this is a good point to come back to our SPP server and check in to see if the upgrade finish. So we'll come back here and we'll see it's still in the rebooting phase of the upgrade. So there it is. We're able to sign in again. Control F5 uh, to force it to reload the cache. And you'll notice our build number has jumped from 2151 to 2153. So, so we like to not leave that snapshot in place any longer than we have to. You know, so VMware snapshots are intended to be short lived things that if you let them live too long, they take up too much space and slow the, the system. So we're going to, you know, after we confirm that things look pretty healthy, now that the upgrade is completed successfully, this is my checkpoint to say, okay, I can now come back in to the snapshot manager and remove this snapshot. We 
had created. And so I'm going to select it, delete that snapshot. Still running here, so we'll give that a moment to finish. All right, so that snapshot is gone. We now have completed the upgrade process. All right, so now that we have completed our resnap build out, we can connect that resnap here into Spectrum Protect Plus. We're going to go under System Configuration, Backup Storage Disk, and refresh here. This is the, the built in local host repositories for demo purposes only. It only has 100 gigs. You really don't want to be using this storage for anything production. It's just for experiments. So this is the point where, you know, why we built the, the standalone vSnap. So we can come in here. Our vSnap, we deployed on SP Plus. Um, sites are a way of grouping together vSnaps. And we get a built in, two built in sites called primary and secondary. And for many solutions, that's enough. You might have a primary site that will be replicated. Secondary. So this is our primary site. So we'll be adding this vSnap into our primary site. And here is where you can use the identity that we pre-created. Um, if you were to put a new a username and password here in these fields without checking this box, it's going to create a new identity specific to this vSnap. But by choosing this, we can now drop down here and pick that one we already created. That way we can use the same identity. If we we're going to build several vSnaps, we could share the same identity. And that way, if if your password's changed on all that machine, you don't have to change five identities. You could just change that one identity to the new password. Resolve the connectivity to all of your vSnaps. Go ahead and click Save. So it was added. So initially, you're going to see that it is ready here. So a vSnap that is ready to be used, you can tell by the capacity it has. So when we deploy a new vSnap to Plus, it takes a moment for Plus to, to reach out and chat with the vSnap to learn things about how much capacity it has. So, you know, one thing that I will point out is we'll notice the software levels here reported for the vSnap. So although I went out to the 10.15 GA, since we bumped up our Plus server to a newer level, there's actually a newer vSnap level. So we could download the, the newer vSnap that came part of that eFix2 and do another, bring the run file over and do another upgrade. We won't do that now. If it's taking a while to, to get to the point where it's displaying things, you can usually come here and, and refresh. That will speed along to the point. So, 25 terabytes capacity with a little over 800 gigs of that slot space that was already used. So we can see now it's in the primary site, ready to be used. The next thing we'll do is come into policy. And while there are some built-in SLAs that we can use, for example, I might want to use the silver policy, which retains backups for a month. Uh, but I want to you know, customize my policy. So so we're going to go ahead and, and build a new one. So we'll call this SLA Blueprint. And I don't want to use, you know, 15 days is just too much for me. I want to bring this down to seven days. Our business requires us to keep seven days worth of recovery points. I do want to take up one backup a day. Um, but I don't want my backups to start at midnight. I prefer that they actually start at 10 p.m. Usually our business is idle at that time. So this is a better time for us to start. Now, and then the most important thing is what site are these backups going to target? So since we put that new vSnap in the site name primary, by having this SLA target the primary site means we'll be using that new vSnap for our backups. So I'm going to go ahead and save this SLA. All right. And now, as a final step, we need to assign virtual machines from our VMware environment for protection. I'm going to come to Hypervisor's VMware see we have 669 machines that are not unprotected at this uh, Here is the interface you use for browsing your VMware environment and assigning them to SLAs. There's different ways you can view your environments. One way I like to look at it is the host and clusters view. Because this is organized in the same layout that you view things in when you're in the vCenter. You should start by clicking at the vCenter level and it presents all of your data centers to you. So I want to find some machines in the in our Blueprint data center. And again, here are the cluster names. Come into the cluster, and then I see hosts. So I, I selected a VMA, then I clicked Select SLA Policy, and that jumps us down to here to show us those policies we can choose from. I'm going to select the Blueprint policy we just created and click Save. And so you'll notice now that this VM indicates we're associated to an SLA policy. So I'm going to go back now one more level, and we'll choose a VM from this host in the same fashion. Select SLA policy, and let's do one more. We'll back up three VMs. And so I'll come back to this 
this data center level, and I'll go into a different cluster. Linux machine here. We'll also assign that to Ruby. Another thing you can do is filter by SOA right here. So right now we're looking at all VMs not filtered by SOA. So another useful view might be, well, show me VMs that are not in an SOA yet. This may be helpful for finding machines that aren't being protected that you want to protect. Another useful view is to, so, well, show me what is in an SOA. So if I select the Blueprint SOA, it should show us that we have three machines selected. In fact, here are the three machines that we assigned to that, that SOA. So we're almost ready to take a backup. There's one last step, and VMware is the one workload that depends on a, a data movement component. We call that the VADP proxy. So if we come here under the system configuration, the same place where we found backup storage, where we registered the vSnap, there is also VADP proxy management. And remember, we elected to manage, to, to use vSnap and VADP together on the same machine. So by default, the SPP server comes with a built-in VADP proxy that's useful for demo purposes. So you'll see it's associated with this site demo. Because it's tied to the site demo, it will not work for our backups, which are using the site primary. And in fact, really, other than demo purposes, you don't want to use this. So my best practice here is that you select this proxy and you come in here and you say suspended. We don't want any backups having any chance of using this built-in local proxy. But here's the one that, again, our vSnap that we just configured on SP Plus Charlie 49 also has the VADP proxy component on it. And because we provided the IP address when we deployed the OVA for this, we provided the IP address of our Plus server. Our Plus server already knows about this proxy. But the remaining step is we need to click Enable Proxy. It is already by default going to join the primary site. And here's where we need to provide some credentials. Now again, since we're co-locating vSnap on here, I have the ability to use that same user ID. But just for organizational purposes, my preference is to separate proxy identities from, from vSnap. So what I'm going to do here is create another identity, call it VADP. I'm going to use the server admin user ID for, for VADP access. So we're going to use user ID server admin. I'm going to apply the password that we changed server admin to when we first signed in to the vSnap for the first time. Now that I've done that, we can come back to VDP proxy, select it, I'm going to enable, and I'm going to say use an existing user, and we're going to use VADP server admin. I'll click enable. It should come into an available state. There it is. It is available. Now, a couple of things you'll notice. One is that it's at a 10.1.4 level. And the reason that is is because we deployed the 10.1.4 version of the combined vSnap and VADP. And the vSnap software is not part of the run file. So when we upgraded the vSnap software, it did not update the VADP proxy level. But that's okay because Plus has the ability to automatically push updates from the SPP server. So that's what this blue arrow here is indicating, that there's a software update available. Now, while we could take a backup with 10.4, it's recommended to keep these versions at the, the same level. So I'm going to select this here now, here to say push update, so that we can speed along that. So again, I'm going to select that user that we created here for the VADP server admin user and say update, and push out the software update. It's actually pushing it from a, a space that's already on the SPP server. So you notice the, the, the built-in one already had it, so this code is actually sitting on the SPP appliance. On it. So no, no, no internet download. Now over time, these updates can actually automatically push out if we had rebooted Okay, so that update was pretty quick. See, it's now in an enabled state. But one other thing we can do from this interface is to set some proxy-specific options. So most of these take defaults. One thing I like to change is to eliminate transports, and the blueprint advises this point, is remove any transports that you know can't be used. So for certain, SAN transport only applies to physical VADP proxies. And since this VADP proxy is running on our virtual vSnap, it's not possible to use the SAN transport. VMware recommends NBD SSL over NBD, so I remove standard NBD. So the only remaining question is, do we want to use hot add? Now, while this proxy sent as virtual would be capable of hot add, our, you know, our business doesn't want us to use hot add. So the preference for us is just to use NBD. So I'm going to reduce the list down to just NBD SSL. I'm going to leave defaults alone. The one that the blueprint discusses is this NBD SSL compression. 
in most cases, this turning this compression on will slow your backups down. This is useful for when your bandwidth between your VADP proxy and your VMware systems is very limited. Let's say you had a one gigabit network. It might make sense to enable the compression feature. If you do enable it, there's a number of, of choices. I think we typically use the fast LZ, but in most cases, you're gonna to wanna to leave this compression disabled. You know, if for certain, if you have a 10 gigabit network, you'll definitely not wanna be using the NVD SSL compression. So really, the only thing I'm changing here is the transport modes. So we'll click Save. So now we have done everything we need to do to be ready to take back. So I'm going to come back to our VMware screen and, and we'll notice the SI policy set. So if we did nothing, we would get a backup today at 10 p.m. this evening. Right? We don't want to wait to 10 p.m. So we're going to force our first backup. The first backup in Spectrum Protect Plus is referred to as the base backup. So it's initial full backup. So I'm going to come to action and say start. So we should see the state of this task going from idle, and now it's going to say running. And so you could view some job lag activity here. You know, the preference now is to go to the newer um, job monitor screen. So there's currently one total job. That job is um, currently running, so it's on the running jobs tab. And we'll notice the name here. The name is the type of endpoint that's being protected. So we're doing a VMware backup, and it's associated to the SLA name blueprint. So jobs are named with a combination of the workload type combined with the SLA name. That's how you can decipher names. So it's currently running. So if we select this job here on the left side, we can see the log information starting to accumulate. And so this little drop down here is filters for the type of log information. And so it's by default narrowed down to just things like errors and, and very high level messages. If you want to you know, follow along to see what's going on initially, you can add in some of these other message types and say apply. And then we'll notice that more things are, are happening. We can see more of the individual point. A couple of things to note here first. One is that there's three VMs that have been identified that are part of it. That makes sense because we only associated three virtual machines with this policy. But it's done a number of other steps, but one thing it's done is it's made a volume for us here on our vSNAP system. So a couple of things to point out. One is that, yes, this is in fact the, the vSNAP we would expect on SP plus Charlie 49. Go back to the, the, the command line for a moment here. Go back to our vSNAP just for one moment. We'll come into SP plus Charlie 49 server admin. So the, the, the vSNAP command line has a lot of other commands. One thing we could say is vSNAP volume show, for example. You'll notice that this volume that it reported right here, 024, that is the one that it just created. So this backup we're running now is going to be using this volume within the vSnap system. You can scroll down a little further now. You'll notice it's initializing backups of some VMs here. Here's the third one, status along the way. So we can continue to watch this. If you look here on the left-hand side, You'll notice you can track progress of the job at a high level by based on how many VMs have completed. So at this point, all three of them are, are still in progress. We're doing full backups. So since this is the very first backup, they have to be full. If we were to repeat this backup after the full, this message will let us know it's doing an incremental backup. You can also see you're going to keep track of how much parallel activity. So for our vSNAP SP Plus Charlie 49, there are six active streams. You might say, well, we're only backing up three machines. Why would there be six streams? Well, a virtual machine can have more than one virtual hard disk. So in my case, all of these virtual machines each have two disks. So three machines running in parallel, each of their disks also going in parallel. We have six backup streams running in parallel. So depending on how many VADP proxies you have, how many vSnaps you have, and how many machines are part of your SLA, this number of, of parallel streams can get quite high. What other indication of back activity can we find at this point? So one thing that might be interesting is to come back to our vSnap and watch network activity, for example. So I'm going to say SAR-N space dev and watch some network interface statistics. It's interesting here, and so let me run it a little bit longer. Let's say 10, watch it for 10 seconds. So it's going to pull the network for 10 seconds and then give us a summary of activity. So at this point, since we're taking backups, we would expect to be receiving data. So the vSnap is receiving data over its network. So it makes sense here 
that we're seeing the received kilobytes per second, uh, you know, over 210,000. So that's that's above 200 and 200 megabytes per second at this point. Uh, it's jumped up. It's getting closer to 300. But one more sample, which we'll see. And so when we end that, we kind of see the the average across all those samples was just under 250 megabytes per second. So that's a little bit more than two gigabits. Um, you know, so I think if we had more machines running in parallel, we would see an even faster throughput. Let's see what else has shown up in the log here. Some more messages. So over time, you know, progress indicators can be logged in here saying how many how many bytes have moved, how many are left. I mean, as an example, for TAP Linux 2.19, it has already transferred a little under 15 gigabytes, which is 14% of the total that needs to go to transfer. And this machine by itself is moving at 50 megabytes per second. We'll see at the end of the job that you know an aggregate statistic for all machines will be reported. So now that we have two devices that we're, we would expect not to have a DDoS ratio above one because we didn't elect to turn on either, but eventually this compression ratio <coughs> will likely go up. It's not instantaneous. We haven't written enough, but to show how you can click on this gear, confirm that we have compression is set, DDoS is not, encryption is on, and it can't be changed because that it can't be turned off. This is where you would also go if you built a, another vSnap at a different site. You define a partner and set it up for replication. Global preferences. Here it's a global preferences. These are under here. The free space warning 25 terabyte vSnap. We set a 25% reserve. If we change this to 25. Well, when there's only 30% free, it's going to start warning us. And 25% free backups. New, new VMs will be prevented from backing up. So thank you, Jason, for walking us through that detailed information about how to implement Spectrum Protect Plus. Be sure to check out the other videos in this Spectrum Protect Plus sizing series. Thanks again.